welcome to our message for Sunday from St Mary's Salby. I'm sorry we're in my study today and we're not in church, but uh, that's the way it has to be. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll study God's word together. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together today when we will hear your word and these oh so familiar words, Lord, we ask that you would open them to us that we may receive something new and remarkable from them. Amen. So let's read the passage again. It's not long and it's always good to remember, remind ourselves of God's word. God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. I read an interesting article this week. It said our society seems very muddled and bewildered and confused and caught in several turbulent cross currents that pull it to and fro. On the one hand, we're expressive individualists who nod our heads when someone expresses distaste, distaste for rules and regulations. And yet, on the other hand, we are preening moralists on moral crusades looking for right to right the wrongs of the day, ready to cancel anyone who impedes the path of progress and justice. Indeed, that's in price precisely what affronts us, the hideous customs of a bygone age. Laws unable to deliver us from, nay, even designed to enshrine injustice. We are a mixture. And yet within all this, we have more great, more health care, greater comfort and more entertainment options. And yet within all this muddle and confusion and plenty, we seem to be more confused and upset and distressed than ever. Our children are particularly more stressed and anxious suffering one of the highest rates of suicide seen in 20 years. Emile Duquesne, he had a description of anomie, as he called it, his Frenchman, or lawlessness, where he said, what happens is where the breakdown of social norms, meaning and cohesion at times of economic stress come about, they contribute to a generalised sense of futility, despair and lack of purpose. We have no rules, we have no meta-narrative by which to live, and therefore we live by whatever moral code we choose to live by and that causes disunity and lack of cohesion and that causes despair and issues within our society. So the Ten Commandments have a powerful place in our modern society. They have something to say to us in the 21st century. And what we have today in these opening verses of the uh, Exodus 20 passage is a father's talk to a son. This is like your dad sitting you down and saying, look, I don't want to cramp your style, but I have these ways which I've always, these rules I've always lived by, and I think they would be good for you to live by. So before we get into commandment number one, we need to understand why these verses matter. And I read a book by Kevin DeYoung, and I agree with what he said. He said that they are vital, not that we must keep them, but because they must shape our lives. This is not a set of rules we must keep at all costs. And if we fail to, they must shape us. This is something more than just a set of rules to obey. It's something that must give function and shape and, and direction to our lives. So why are they important? Well, firstly, they're important because they remind us of who we are in chapter 19, verse 6. God tells the people they're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and he says the same thing to us. And therefore, as a holy nation, a royal priesthood set apart by God, we are given rules which the world doesn't understand to live by. Of course, we're not always the holy people we should be, but that's what he's called us to be. That's what he wants us to be. That's who we are. We are God's people set apart to live according to God's ways. And so these commands matter because even when Jesus summarizes them he doesn't just doesn't take away anything from them and he doesn't add anything to them he just reinforces them secondly they're important because they speak of who God is he is sovereign self-existent self-sufficient almighty creator he is the God who brought the plagues on the people of Egypt he is the God who parted the Red Sea and kept the people uh, fed with manna in the wilderness he is not a God to be trifled with and if he is God, and he's anything like the God revealed in my Bible, then it would be extremely stupid, foolish and dangerous for me to crowdsource, as one person said, my own ethical code, because his ethical code matters. Thirdly, after all this, he's on our side. 
He is our Father. He gives us commands because he wants us to live lives that are fulfilled and free and good. Fourthly, he wants us to be free. I've just said that. But freedom is not what we understand freedom to be. We, we in the secular world in the 21st century think of freedom as doing whatever you want. Freedom in God's understanding is doing what he wants and enjoying the benefits of doing that. We too often think of the Ten Commandments as constraining us, as if God wants to keep us in servitude and stop us from realising our dreams and reaching our potential. We, forgot that, we forget that God's delight is to give us abundant life, John 10.10, 10, and true freedom, John 8.32. His law, 1 John 5.3 tells us, are not burdensome. They are about setting us free. And finally, they are the way we love out our, live out our loving response to God's grace. Salvation is not a reward for obedience. Salvation is the reason for obedience. Just listen to that again. Salvation is not a reward for obedience to the Ten Commandments. Salvation is the reason we obey the Ten Commandments. Jesus never said, if you obey my commandments, I will love you. Instead, when he washes the disciples' feet in John 14, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. All of our doing is only because of what he did in the first place. And that's where we start our reading today. God says, I am God. And don't forget what I've done for you. That I saved you and brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery as he's brought us from slavery to sin. So they matter. They matter today as much as they mattered when they were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And those are the reasons they matter. So... To the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Let's start with a quick look at what we most value in life, for instance. So imagine your house is on fire and you've taken the family and the pets to safety. What would you risk your life to go and answer, uh, go and save? For me, uh, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing I would do that because I wouldn't want to put myself at risk. But those things you might hang on to might be gods, might be idols in your life. They might be the things that give meaning and purpose to your life. Most people today would say, if you ask them what gives meaning and purpose to life, they'd say physical and mental well-being. That's an enormous thing at the moment. It might be belonging to something or someone and recognition for being a good person. It might be personally treasured activities. They give meaning and purpose to life. Person, they're, they're personally treasured activities, but all those things fade. Physical and mental well-being fade as we get older. Belonging and recognitions change as we stop doing our jobs. Personally treasured possessions break and personal treasured activities we can no longer do because we get old. So time with grandchildren eventually comes to an end because the grandchildren grow up and they go off to university or they move away from the area, sometimes across the world. So there are many things which we think give meaning and purpose to life, but they are temporary and they, they they come and they go. In these verses, we, we see God saying, I'm never going to be like that. We've seen that in scripture. We've seen that in our journey through the book of Joshua. He's saying, I'm the king. I'm the ruler of the world. I'm a caring king. And I expect in return for my love, utter loyalty. By implication, anything else is akin to treason. Now, treason is defined in law as the crime of betraying one's country, especially by attempting to kill or overthrow the sovereign. Now, that's the key here. Every time we place another idol in God's place, we overthrow the sovereignty of God in our lives. We ignore the fact that other things have become priorities in God's place and we commit treason. So what are the gods of the modern age? Well, Bible, well first, before we look at that, let's look at where this idol making comes from. The Bible tells us that the idol factory is our hearts. It takes good things and makes them into idols that drive us. And the simplest, the simplest things can take that place. And it can be summed up in the American dream. In the Declaration of Independence, it says all men are created equal, to which we as Christians would say amen. But it then goes on to say that everybody has the inalienable right to life, yes, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
This has become our God, hasn't it? Self-fulfillment. Your God must take second place to the pursuit of happiness, says the world. But God demands total loyalty. Imagine if I said to Becky, you're my number one wife. No matter how many wives I take, you'll always be the first. That's not going to be a good recipe for a marriage because love demands exclusivity. Becky doesn't want to be the number one wife. She wants to be the only wife, the only person I love and treasure. Not because she doesn't love me and she wants to restrict me and squeeze me and restrict my enjoyment of life, but because she does love me. She wants me to be fulfilled in our marriage relationship. So we understand they're important. And this one is saying that God must come first if we want to know the true God. We want to experience peace and we want a lasting hope that will outlast our frail bodies and feeble activities. So let's do a bit of self-diagnosis as we know we now what must come first. So I want you to listen to the following questions and just reflect on them for a moment. What do you feel you need in order for life to be good? What makes life worth living for you? When you dream about the future, what do you dream about obtaining? Where do you go for comfort? We have a choice. Heather made that clear last week in Joshua 24, in her sermon on Joshua 24. We do, we, do we see God as a person who restricts us and we reject him and follow the gods of this world as the uh, people of Israel were offered to follow the gods of Cana? Or do we fall in line with a God loving father who wants to give us good rules to live by? I recently read a really good book called Live Not By Lies by Robert Dreher. And he sums it all up very well. He wrote his book about the way in which Christianity was maintained in the Eastern Bloc during the communist period. And he writes this. Secular liberal idea of freedom so popular in the West is a lie. That is the concept that real freedom is found in liberating the self from all binding commitments to God, to marriage and to family and by increasing worldly comforts. That is the road, I'm afraid, that leads to hell, he writes. Just listen to that again. The Ten Commandments are there to protect us from this. The secular liberal idea of freedom so popular in the West is a lie. That is the concept that real freedom is found in liberating the self from all binding commitments to God, marriage and family, and by increasing the worldly comforts. That is the road that leads to hell. It's true, isn't it? And this first commandment is key to understanding the rest of the commandments. Because breaking the first commandment leads to breaking the others. I commit murder because I am more important than the person I'm killing. I steal because I want. I covet because I want. If you look deeply into the ways that we disobey God, you will usually find the root it causes idolatry. The areas in our lives where we're breaking the commandments are like smoke from a fire. If your house was on fire, you wouldn't try and put the smoke out. You'd put the fire out. And the seat of the problem is not the smoke, is not the stealing, the swearing, the gossiping. It's the idol, the fire that is the idol that lies at the centre of our hearts. So if we follow the trail of black smoke back to the fire, we'll find the altars of the idols that we're worshipping. Sin and disobedience cannot be fixed by changing behaviour. We must go to the attitude that leads to the action, the adulterous, idolatrous heart that leads to the idolatrous action. Worshipping something or someone else other than God leads us and will always lead us to sin. Therefore, to truly escape the harmful effects of sinful behaviour, we need to root out the idol worship that causes it. So what have we learned today? We've learned the Ten Commandments still matter. They're very important. They are, an out, they are lived as an outworking of our love to God. And they're given as an expression of God's love for us. We have a very false idea about what freedom is. Freedom, we think, is doing what the hell we like. Whereas true freedom is living according to God's purposes, according to God's laws. And that God's way is the right way. 
and who are we need to root out and find out what our true God is. We still need the 10 words, writes Kevin de Young, handed down at Sinai. They've changed in some respects by coming from by, by the coming of Christ for sure. Transformed but not trashed. That's key. They're transformed but not trashed. We no longer keep the Ten Commandments rightly because we now keep them in Christ and through Christ and with the all-suppressing greatness of Christ. We are new creations in Christ. The law is not only our duty, it's our delight. If we want to love Christ as he deserves and as he desires, we will keep his commandments. And Jesus never says the Ten Commandments have, have, have gone. So we break the first commandment every time we do something else, because it's at the root of them all. Now, I want to refresh your view of the commandments. Rather than being restrictions, I want to take an image which Sabine Baring Gould takes and open it a little bit. She says the fold is the place where he keeps his flock. The image here is one of protection, God holding the sheep in a safe place, shut behind hurdles. And she says those hurdles are the Ten Commandments. Every now and then one of the sheep leaps over the hurdles or pushes its way between them and heads off for forbidden pastures. But what does God do? Does God let the sheep go and just condemn the sheep to whatever its fate is? No. He, the, he goes after it as a good shepherd and brings the erring sheep back. There's always forgiveness and restoration and a fresh start. So we start the Ten Commandments, journey through the Ten Commandments. Let's see them not as roadblocks or barriers or restrictions, but let's see them as loving instruction from a loving God lived out of our gracious response to his love and his grace. Let's challenge the way we think about them and let's root down hard into our hearts and think about what are the idols that we have in our lives. As I said before, don't forget those questions which I set uh, you. What do you feel you need in order for life to be good? Is it a good pension? Is it a good salary? Is it a nice home? Is it a, a loving family? Is it a marriage? They're not things you need for life to be good. What you need is a relationship with the loving Heavenly Father, your King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What makes life worth living? A good job? A fulfilling role in your job? A successful career? No. What makes life worth living is knowing that you are a child of the Heavenly Father, loved and treasured by Him. What do you dream about for the future? What do you dream about obtaining? Well, that's self-evident. I want to obtain salvation. I want to obtain hope and peace and purpose in my life. And I can only do that through a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And where do I go for my comfort? Now, this is a tricky one because I'm going to be shot for this because my wife is an avid gardener. But if you find your comfort and peace in gardening above in God or in whatever activity you take, walking, running, cycling, you may, and I'm only saying you may, be placing that above God because when we need comfort we should run to the arms of the loving Heavenly Father. So let's keep that image that Sabine Bearing Gold uh, gives us of the Ten Commandments as the hurdles of the sheepfold where the sheep are protected and cared for and loved. So it makes a big difference to how we view the commandments if we see them in that way. So may God bless you this week. Let's take time to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Ten Commandments, for the loving care they show that's in God's heart towards us. Amen. Have a good week. And if you need me, you know where I am. And by the way, as I always say, it's great to be able to speak to you online, but I'd love to be able to meet you and share with you face to face. So if you listen to us online, please think about coming to church on a Sunday morning. We would love to see you.